Действительно, мероприятие значимое и знаковое для республики. Это был первый наш выход на площадку такого уровня, на международную площадку. Присутствовало 17 делегаций из разных стран, то есть все эти слухи и месседжи, которые мы от украинской стороны получаем о том, что им удалось сорвать это заседание, это все абсолютно неправда. То есть... Это достаточно большое количество участников для формулы Ария, тем более, то есть это действительно большой состав. Мы, как и ожидали, мы услышали заинтересованность со стороны некоторых участников, некоторых членов Совета Безопасности, в частности, от представителя Китая прозвучал интересный вопрос, интересная позиция, достаточно нейтральная и сбалансированная. От Индонезии, от представителя Беларуси. То есть вопросов было много. Мы с Владиславом Николаевичем подробно и детально осветили, насколько время позволяло, осветили ход переговорного процесса, итоги выполнения совместно согласованного коммунике лидеров нормандского формата прошлого года. Прозвучало несколько тезисов и месседжей, как можно было бы выйти из того тупика, из того кризиса, который на сегодняшний день существует в переговорном процессе. Обратили внимание на то, что с украинской стороны абсолютно не предпринимается никаких шагов в направлении реализации, не политического, в частности, больше всего, конечно, политического блока. Мы Какова были... Была что, что? Какова была реакция? Чувствовалось ли, ну, скажем так, направление как какой-то непризнанный, непризнанному государству? Либо это было вполне равноправное общение? Это было полноценное общение. Формула Ария и формат заседаний не предусматривает прямых дискуссий, то есть вступления в полемику, но тем не менее были, опять же повторюсь, были озвучены доклады, тезисы и месседжи от представителей других стран. Мы отвечали на вопросы, которые задавались, то есть это было полноценное участие в заседании. Был демарш со стороны представителей Украины. Мы, кстати, этого вполне, это вполне ожидаемое поведение, вполне ожидаемая реакция. Удивились мы только в отношении поведения представителей Франции и Германии, поскольку а, они также поддержали Украину и не присутствовали на этом заседании вчерашнем. А, Видимо, это, действительно, это действительно нас несколько удивило. Я не скажу, что мы были шокированы или обескуражены, но это несколько нас удивило, потому что заинтересованность как раз у этих стран должна быть прямая в том, чтобы услышать вторую сторону конфликта, чтобы получить информацию из первых рук и затем, участвуя в том же нормандском формате, допустим, да, как страны-гаранты реализации Минских соглашений, имея полноту информации, имея полную картину, можно было бы гораздо более эффективно и плодотворно участвовать в этом процессе. Но, тем не менее, было решено проигнорировать вчерашнее заседание. Мы можем сделать выводы, исходя из такого отношения к этой инициативе Российской Федерации. Мы теперь еще лучше понимаем поведение украинской стороны, когда они отказываются общаться и согласовывать что-либо, и проводить консультации, как это прямо предписано комплексом мер на Минской переговорной площадке. То есть если сопосредники, иные сопосредники, да, западные гаранты Минских соглашений ведут себя соответственно таким же образом, то, естественно, и украинские представители могут себе позволить такое. Есть разочарование, поскольку были все-таки надежды, что западные гаранты 
в лице Германии и Франции нацелены на мир, нацелены на мирное урегулирование, а, соответственно, на диалог между двумя сторонами конфликта и хотя бы как минимум на получение полноценной информации о том, что же происходит. Если э, мы видим по вчерашней встрече, что такого интереса нет, соответственно, этот весь процесс, он э, под большим вопросом, он не просто в стагнации, он действительно под большим вопросом. Что же тогда, э, над чем же мы работаем и что же мы обсуждаем, и чему посвящены эти переговоры в Минске, если такое отношение со стороны гарантов к этим Минским соглашениям. Э, вот э, будем дальше думать и решать, что будет происходить. Будем смотреть на следующее заседание контактной группы, какова будет реакция, каково будет поведение представителей Украины. То есть на данный момент, еще раз повторюсь, наличествует переговорный кризис. Так, возможно, стоит еще раз вот в подобном формате встретиться, попробовать. Вы видите в будущем еще наше участие в таких встречах? Конечно, нам бы хотелось, чтобы эти встречи продолжались. Мы безумно благодарны постоянному представительству Российской Федерации в Совете Безопасности ООН за эту инициативу. Мы считаем ее крайне полезной с точки зрения возможности мирного урегулирования конфликта. Надеемся, что в будущем такие встречи будут происходить и с присутствием в том числе представителей стран-гарантов и европейского сообщества. Но возможно ли это? И опять же мы услышали даже сомнения со стороны постоянного представителя Российской Федерации Небензи о том, что и нормандский формат сейчас под большим вопросом в своей полезности, скажем так, в рамках мирного урегулирования. То есть если два из, вернее даже три представителя из четырех не присутствуют на встрече, которая могла бы прояснить детали дальнейшего урегулирования, отказываются присутствовать на этой встрече, соответственно вопрос, для чего тогда работает этот нормандский формат и каковы цели новой встречи в нормандском формате. Собственно, да, вопросов очень много, и это еще, наверное, одна из причин и одна из целей, которая была достигнута тем, что была организована эта встреча. Это высветить эти вопросы, продемонстрировать их, то есть чтобы они появились на поверхности. Потому что мы-то со своей стороны, как представители республик, мы давно задаем эти вопросы и публично в средствах массовой информации. И на, сами, на самих переговорах мы задаем украинской стороне. Вы э, готовы, как представители государства э, Украина, следовать тем самым Минским соглашением и реализовывать комплекс мер так, как он был подписан и как он был одобрен Советом Безопасности ООН. Внятного ответа мы не получаем. И для нас понятно, как для представителей, участвующих в этом процессе, что нет такой готовности с украинской стороны. Но чтобы высветить, проиллюстрировать, продемонстрировать Отсутствие такой готовности, отсутствие такой политической воли со стороны Украины, наверное, необходимо было провести все-таки вот такую встречу, на которой э, Украина всему миру продемонстрировала вот это свое отсутствие готовности и отсутствие этой воли. Это действительно тоже одна из таких важных составляющих и очень демонстративная составляющая этой встречи. Presents attempts to frame the format of Normandy summit, which comprises Ukraine, Russia, France, and Germany, as a kind of the only real framework for the settlement in Ukraine. This is a complete appending of all the logic of diplomatic efforts deployed in this regard from the very beginning. Normandy summits do not substitute Minsk framework and are, and are, and are only aimed at reviewing progress made between Kyiv, Donetsk, and Lugansk. This becomes crystal clear if we turn to the decisions of the last Normandy summit, 
uh, which took place in Paris on December 9, 2019. The President of Ukraine, Vladimir Zelensky, President of France, Emmanuel Macron, the German Chancellor, Angela Merkel, and the Russian President, Vladimir Putin, issued a document called Common Agreed Conclusions. What has been achieved a year since, we will learn from our briefings. We wanted a representative from the Ukrainian government to participate in this meeting today as a briefer. I sent a letter to the permanent representative of Ukraine requesting him to facilitate, to facilitate this. The letter remains unanswered till today. We are particularly appalled by the efforts of our German and French colleagues, the number of participants, to boycott this meeting under ridiculous pretext that the format of the meeting does not fall under Normandy format. Moreover, we know that they worked tirelessly with delegations to dissuade them from participating. Not only this is shameful, but it also goes contrary to the established Security Council practice, whereby area formula meetings are not blocked or sabotaged, whatever the subject is. As, as you see, they were partly successful. Our Western colleagues chose to ignore it. We have a question, why they are so scared to listen or talk to the people who represent Donbass? They are people after all, and they at least deserve to be heard. Why they deny them their legitimate right to speak out? They don't want, as they tell us, to upstage Donetsk and Lugansk. And I would like to tell you that the representatives that you see here today are the ones who negotiate on behalf of Donetsk and Lugansk in the Minsk contact group. We also have uh, Mr. Mikhail Pogrebinsky, a politologist from Kyiv. What was wrong listening to him? What's his fault? Our colleagues even insisted that the meeting should not be broadcast through the UN Web TV as other area formula meetings. It simply reflects their fear to hear the truth about what's really happening in Donbass. They would prefer to shut the mouths of its residents. But instead, we have our YouTube streaming today uh, about which we informed the general public. By the way, it's not the first time when our colleagues do it in the council in such a way. On October 30, 2018, delegations of France, Netherlands, Peru, Poland, Sweden, UK, and US blocked participation of a representative of an electoral body in Lugansk, Ms. Yelena Kravchenko, <clears throat> despite the fact that the meeting was convened to discuss the ongoing electoral process. As you see, the truth is not a welcome commodity with these states. What happened today compromises the role of Berlin and Paris as intermediaries in solving Ukrainian crisis. They look more how to cover up Kyiv authorities instead. That raises questions as to the expediency of future Normandy summits without the implementation of their provisions and the Minsk agreements by all parties. They do not seem to have any value added. With this presentation, uh, I am pleased to introduce our panelists, Ms. Natalia Nikonorova and Mr. Vladislav Deinega, representatives of Donetsk and Lugansk, or other Lugansk and Donetsk, uh, regions of Donbass in the Minsk contact group, as well as Mr. Mikhail Pogrebinsky, director of Kyiv Center of Political Studies and Conflictology. And now I would like to give the floor to Ms. Natalia Nikanorova. Greetings, dear participants of today's meeting. Uh, First of all, I would like to pay special attention and express my deepest gratitude to the delegations from more than 10 countries who take part in today's meeting. Thus, it is fair to say that all attempts of certain states to sabotage this event are failed. For me, as a plenipotentiary of Donetsk People's Republic in Minsk negotiations, it is of a high honor and importance to give a report on the real situation in Donbass and at the Minsk talks. Uh, I would like to continue. Uh, I would like, first of all, to thank you for this opportunity, and I would like to continue uh, my briefing in Russian in order to provide you with more precise and detailed information. Uh, the simultaneous translation uh, is provided by the Russian mission to the UN Security Council, uh, what we highly appreciate. Um, 
Еще раз добрый день всем, всем участникам. Хочу еще раз подчеркнуть важность и нашу благодарность за возможность донести нашу точку зрения на все события, которые сегодня происходят в Донбассе и те события, которые происходят в переговорном процессе в Минске. Эта встреча действительно очень важна для нас, поскольку она дает нам возможность донести нашу точку зрения, точку зрения второй стороны конфликта Донецкой и Луганской народных республик. При этом хочу отметить, что все, что мы будем сегодня озвучивать, мы готовы подтвердить конкретными фактами и аргументами. Мы готовы ответить на любой вопрос. Хочу вкратце остановиться на истоках конфликта. Я думаю, все участники сегодняшней встречи в той или иной мере ознакомлены с тем, что происходило в Киеве в феврале 2014 года. Но я думаю, не все знают, что же происходило в это время в Донецке и в Луганске. После переворота, который произошел в 2014 году, в феврале, естественно, люди в Донецкой области и в Луганской области были возмущены, были напуганы, могу сказать это откровенно. Но в тот момент, что удивительно и что интересно, никто не призывал отделяться от Украины или идти, например, на Киев войной. На самом деле в Донецке люди собирались на митинги и обращались к своим представителям местной власти, к депутатам Донецкого областного совета, чтобы они выступили как их, действительно, как их представители и защитили их права, то есть обратились непосредственно к представителям киевской новой власти с неким воззванием, с неким заявлением о том, каким образом хотят жить, на каком языке хотят хотят говорить и какие права нуждаются в защите э, людей Донбасса. Э, но, э, тем не менее, украинские э, новые власти начали свой путь э, с таких шагов, которые еще больше напугали население Донбасса. Э, то есть первый же закон the law that banned free usage of the Russian language. Besides, after the position was expressed uh, about non-acceptance of what, is going, what, what was going on in eastern regions of Ukraine, with the help of nationalist and radical elements of the society, the Ukrainian authorities started a blatant massacre and cleansing of all who disagreed. These are events uh, in Odessa on 2nd of May, uh, 3rd of May in Slavansk, 9th of May in Mariupol. According to official statistics in Odessa, about 48 people died. At least 250 were injured. On 9th of May in Mariupol, uh, more than 20 people were died. Uh, on the 3rd of May, during the storm of Slavansk, more than 30 peaceful citizens died. All those events could not, could not calm down the population of Donbass. On the contrary, they instilled fear and alarm. After that, the population was actually asked about how they saw their future and the decision was made to hold a referendum. Another point, the local council The full local council, in fact, fled the Donetsk region, so people had no one to turn to to proclaim this referendum and to convene it. There was the total lack of state power because there was no single legal representative from the point of view of Ukrainian authorities. Nevertheless, there was such referendum that turned out is self-explanatory. It is about 75% of the population, out of them 90%, to be exact, 89.7% uh, voted in favor of independence. This shows the degree to which people was not, were not able to accept what was going on in Ukraine. 
I'd like to mention that Ukrainian constitution is a direct action act and its article 38 says that people have a right to take part in state affairs during uh, all Ukrainian and local referendums. However, Ukraine still has no law about local referendums and the order of their convening, which means that this direct action act uh, of the constitution is in fact blocked by the effective legislation. However, the people of Donbas used this direct action act, article 38 of the Ukrainian constitution. And the very same right is indicated in the UN Charter, as a matter of fact. In response to such actions, the Kyiv authorities waged a full-fledged war on the population of Donbas. The so-called anti-terrorist operation that was uh, aimed against the population of Donbas has been in effect uh, for seven years by now. Later, it was renamed as Joint Forces Operation, but it doesn't change it ma its matter. The military forces of Ukraine are used against the people of Donbas. Um, since then, uh, no less than 13,000 people in Donbas died out of them, 149 children. Just think of it, those were children who could take no part uh, in any armed action, they've just killed 80% of the of those 13,000 people were the victims, according to UN human rights, and those victims were on our side. Those are people who died from the shelling of Ukrainian armed forces. Against that background, we had nothing else to do but to protect ourselves, to protect our land, to protect the people of Donbas, and to respond to this undeclared yet effective war. We were at home, we had nowhere to go. We had to defend ourselves. So we responded in a way that Ukrainian armed forces were turned back uh, in cauldrons uh, and um, uh, Ilovartsova, Ismailova and Debaltsova. In that situation, we were not very willing to sign the Minsk agreements and the package of measures because we were in a strong position from the point of view of armed conflict and people's support was very strong. However, thanks to the mediation institution, our leaders were convinced that continuation of conflict and of armed confrontation uh, meant more victims. That is why we signed the package of measures. We agreed with the rules and principles enshrined in the Minsk agreements. And now I'd like to go a word to the main topic of this meeting, namely implementation of the Minsk agreements and the implementation of uh, final provisions of the uh, Paris Norman Disarmament last year in December. Since the Minsk agreements were agreed, it has been six years, but I must say that not a single provision of those documents has been implemented in full. Let me make a point about the provisions that provide a clear demonstration of what has not been implemented and why. Let us start with uh, point one of uh, the outcomes of the Paris summit. Uh, namely, the immediate measures to stabilize the situation in conflict zones. This is the security block. Full and comprehensive implementation uh, of ceasefire, as provided for in the first paragraph of this clause, was not completed and has not been completed yet. So what is the story of the attempt to implement this clause in the Minsk group? 
We, as plenipotentiary representatives of the second side of the conflict, starting from May 2018, six times sent our proposals, our drafts, on full and comprehensive ceasefire. Those proposals contained concrete steps that were to be observed in order to maintain ceasefire, to maintain it by both sides of conflict, by armed formations on the both sides. However, Kyiv gave us no official reply, no written reply at all. And in words, they simply refused to discuss or negotiate anything and just ignored our proposals. However, in 2019, in July, on the 17th of July, we negotiated the so-called indefinite truce. This truce contained those measures, the, those steps to preserve the ceasefire, but it was adopted in a declarative mode, orally. That is why Kyiv did not feel compelled to observe those provisions. Since then, we have taken three more written attempts, attempts to, to put our obligations down in writing. And this contains an interesting moment that each side has to adopt a decree on the ceasefire and to make it public. We suggested signing this, but Ukraine refused on the pretext that such a decree would constitute uh, a classified information, a state secret. We noticed such a peculiar feature of Ukrainian side. Any decisions negotiated by Ukraine are negotiated precisely at the point when eminent political events are happening in Ukraine, for example, election campaign, or the moment when President Zelensky needs a meeting in Normandy format. This was the case with Green on indefinite truce in July 2019, uh, before parliamentary elections and negotiating of Steinmeier formula, before the meeting of Normandy format, and actually the signing of the measures that we have proposed for two years. This happened before the local elections, at the moment when there was a local election campaign. On the 22nd of July, we finally signed this document with additional measures. And in the first two months after the signing, it was really calm. There were no people killed or injured no civil infrastructure was destroyed. So we can say that uh, the ceasefire was effective for some time. However, local elections came to their end and we started to observe the following events. One of the additional measures says that no side should make uh, steps to advance the other side which means that no, const no new constructions must be engineered, no new trenches, no new dugouts. We pointed out that we see this activity on the Ukrainian side in Shumi settlement, and in order to implement a joint inspection, which is a measure uh, provided for in the document that we signed, to implement this measure, we proposed to the Ukrainian side to inspect this Shumi settlement in order to verify whether new trenches and new dugouts really had been constructed or not. However, the Ukrainian side toppled this joint inspection several hours before this inspection, it provided renewed demands for some documents uh, that could not physically be met within the remaining hours before the planned inspection. And after that, the Ukrainian side 
refused to implement this clause at all. They said they did not understand the essence of this clause and the way it should be implemented. So this clause is not effective today, which actually makes uh, all measures to preserve the ceasefire null and void, because without this clause, all those measures are purely declarative. They do not uh, then have an opportunity to be verified whether there was any violation or not. It is not surprising for us that after those events, there were more and more violations. 157 violations have been made by now. There have occurred more victims uh, among the civil population, a young man and his 69-year-old grandfather, who on the 12th of November uh, were shell-shocked uh, in uh, Alexandrovka settlement. Also, our military servicemen are dying. I would not go deep into detail on that, but I would like to outline the methods that Ukrainian armed forces are using. They are somehow similar to methods that ISIL militants use. They drop grenades and explosive devices from UAVs, so they tie uh, an explosive up to a drone and then drop it on our settlements or populated areas. Uh, a commander of our battalion died at the moment when he was trying to evacuate uh, a dead body of his fellow soldier from the battlefield. He was killed by a sniper shot. So these are the methods that uh, armed forces of Ukraine employ. So the measures that were taken to contain them are not working. Let me also make a point about the political aspect, which is no less important, probably even more important uh, in terms of long-term settlement of the conflict. conflict. During the Paris summit, the sides agreed that in Minsk, the sides will have to negotiate and finalize all legal aspects, all aspects of Donbass legal status. Unfortunately, we did not even get down to this. Let me give you an example that has to do with Steinmeier formula and its uh, introduction to Ukrainian legislation. After on the 10th of October 2016, the formula was adopted and there were instructions and recommendations from the Normandy Forum to negotiate it at the Minsk platform. Right after that, this point was a priority issue at the agenda. However, during many dozens of meetings, during 67 meetings, the Ukrainian side blocked the discussion of this issue, which is for two years and 11 months, Ukraine was blocking this issue. And only on the 1st of October 2019, when there was a need for another summit, the Ukrainian side finally signed this document and negotiated uh, consolidated this formula that had already been agreed in the Normandy format. You can make sure of that by opening, by going to Verkhovna Rada website and looking through uh, the legislation. Steinmeier formula has still not been implemented in the special status law. It is not there, despite the fact that it had has been adopted four or five times already. So we do not see even attempts to have dialogue, to attempt a dialogue on the part of Ukraine, even though this dialogue is directly prescribed in the package of measures, the document that was endorsed by the UN Security Council. On the contrary, the Ukrainian side, by adopting decrees that run counter to the Minsk agreements and to the package of measures. Such decrees are about 60 in number. I could actually list them, but I think you have an opportunity to, to get to yourself familiarized with them in the report that we hope the Russian mission will share with all the participants of this meeting. But I assure you that those decrees do not only uh, viol do not only 
run counter to the Minsk agreement, but they violate such rights uh, as the right to life, to health and safe living conditions, right to liberty and security of person, right to freedom of movement, right to a fair trial, right to an effective remedy, right to the inviolability of home, right to private property, right to freedom of economic activity. I Here I could basically list almost all political basic civil rights, cultural rights of people that are violated by those decrees. Let me make a special point about recent uh, draft law of Ukraine, draft law on internment, a very interesting one, which without any right to appeal stipulates that the general staff of Ukraine armed forces will take a decision about internment of uh, citizens to some specified locations. The draft law presented by the Ukrainian side as a plan of action to implement the Minsk agreements to by 78% contradicts those very Minsk agreements because it totally rewrites the order of implementation of the agreements. Out of 51 paragraphs, 40 run counter to the package of measures. So the negotiations process remains blocked. I have outlined two areas, political and where security no areas, where not a single dialogue step was taken to make solutions on the contrary we constantly hear from the landscape his team about plan b plan c some other ideas and judging by the aggressive rhetoric of those statements we're talking not about peaceful intentions of kiev Zelensky stated that on the 9th of december of 2020 is the end of the term during which the Ukraine supposedly follows the mix agreements, which means Ukraine right now is a step away from the official refusal of the peaceful plan approved by the UN Security Council. And in this regard, we have a question. Will there be a reaction, a response from you, dear members of the UN Security Council, to such official denial of Ukraine to implement the above mentioned plan? Today, our meeting is about the um, results of our activity and our actions a year after Paris summit. Ukraine hasn't implemented none of the paragraphs of the agreed conclusions. So despite all our proposals of their implementation, the representatives of Kiev simply refuse to accept them, to work with them, to comment them in any sort or make any remarks. And with the, um, such refusal of, of the second party, the dialogue is impossible. It's just the same as clapping with one hand. It's impossible to do. It's impossible to settle the conflict without dialogue. And with all that said, the situation, the peaceful negotiation pro process is critical. We think that the Security Council has the right and all the necessary um, leverages to call Ukraine for responsibility and to answer for their action. We don't want this collection, although we know how to protect themselves. We want peace and prosperity for the best. We want to, for it to develop the social economic potential, for the rights to be observed, for the freedoms to be observed, um, for all our um, political and civil rights to be observed, uh, taking account all the values that are stipulated in the international tool. Thank you for your attention. If briefing now according according to the logic i would uh, be willing to give uh, the floor to the representatives of uh, kiev authorities uh, but uh, as you know they chose to ignore this meeting they are now busy celebrating the victory over russia in sabotaging it uh, and i i uh, would like to give the floor uh, to uh, to a person who does not represent authorities, but he is from Kyiv. He is the director of the uh, Center for Political Studies uh, and Conflictology, Mr. Mikhail Pogrebinsky. Mr. Pogrebinsky, you have the floor. Thank you to the organizers of this event. Thank you to all the delegations of the countries that 
that took their time to take part in the meeting. Uh, I'm in a rather complicated position, as well as Vasily. I would consider it appropriate if now the official delegation of Ukraine took the floor, the representatives of the government and authorities took the floor, who would file the possibility to somehow present their vision. And the fact that I accepted the invitation to take part in this event is justified by the fact that I think that little is known about all the developments in the eastern Ukraine. Little is known by the global community in general. And since I studied in detail for a long time and monitored the events uh, throughout this conflict, I think it would be useful to listen to some of my considerations. And at the same time, I have no intention to criticize all the speeches that I've just heard by the representatives of the separate regions of uh, Donetsk and Luhansk, uh, as they called here unrecognized republics, as well as I cannot take responsibility to declare that I represent the position of Kyiv. Moreover, I um, often criticize uh, the authorities of Ukraine in the key of space. But here at the platform of the UN Security Council, I would like to explain uh, why there are impasses uh, in the settlement of the situation. And probably, and I hope so, it will give an impetus towards uh, with uh, the participation of the global community, including the representatives of the UN Security Council. We will have some impetus to move the process towards ending this slow moving opposition and achieving a sustainable peace in my country. But I'll begin with the history of the conflict. I will not start with the beginning, but just about the Minsk process, because this process, the document, is, uh, a, uh, is a complex of four documents. Two of those were adopted in September 2014. And the third, which is the package of measures that was approved by the UN Security Council and that became an international tool that is called the package of measures on the implementation of the Minsk agreements. And of course, there's the fourth document, and these are the conclusions of the Paris summit, the anniversary of which we're celebrating or mentioning right now. The key document is the package of measures, and it is this document uh, that is the main obstacle and the reason of the impasse in the process of the settlement of the conflict. And in order to understand that, I would like to remind that it was adopted at the time, and Natalia mentioned the circumstances well when it was adopted. We have to understand the Ukrainian side, represented by Poroshenko, was at a critical, not even dramatic, but tragic situation when thousands of Ukrainian soldiers were in a very complicated situation and there was a need um, whatever it took to stop uh, the military actions and we signed this document the package of measures that as it turns out as it turned out right uh, right after its adoption that the ukrainian politicians uh, were not okay with this document, they did not approve it, they criticized it, and there was a perception was formed that this, those obligations are impossible to implement. On the one side, this situation 
is as follows. On the one side, there is no willingness and no opportunity. Why there is no opportunity, I will explain later. There is no willingness to implement the package of measures by the previous authorities, I mean, President Poroshenko and the current authorities. The general reason is, is that such serious changes to the construction of Ukrainian state, which is envisaged by this package of measures, I mean, the inclusion of special status of certain areas of Donetsk and Luhansk regions uh, in the constitution of Ukraine to, to anchor those obligations once and for good. And this encounters counteraction of large part of Ukrainian political elite, which makes it very difficult, even despite the fact that Zelensky came to power with a majority which started to degrade a couple of months later after the parliament started at work. This requires a special procedure and a vote by constitutional majority. And it required consolidated efforts of the entire political elite. This is why it is so hard to advance this process. If Ukrainian politicians believe that implementation of the agreement is impossible, then they probably could proclaim they could not implement it and that they wanted to withdraw. But the problem is that not only that this is that this document is agreed by the Security Council, but also, and it is my private opinion, which does not correspond to the opinion of any representative of Ukrainian authority, I believe I understand that representative of, of France Germany, the United States are not interested, they are not interested in having Ukraine withdraw from the Minsk agreements because the very fact of readiness or consent or formal consent to implement it. Because formally Ukraine still says it is ready to implement the agreements. It was said that Ukraine is getting ready for a military solution, but the official position of Ukraine is that there is no military solution to the conflict in the east of Ukraine. And I hope that this reflects the real situation and the real sentiment in the corridors of Ukrainian political establishments. So getting back to why countries are not interested, I believe there is a direct link between sanctions against the Russian Federation with the implementation of the Minsk agreements. Because every time anti-Russian sanctions need to be prolonged, we hear words that Russia does not implement, uh, without going deep into details, if it's true or not, I'm just describing the situation. Uh, there, are, there are words that Russia does not implement the Minsk agreements. That is why sanctions should be prolonged. And Ukraine, not only because there is a decision of the Security Council, but because it does not fall in the in today's interests of Ukraine, the position that corresponds to the position of their partners in the European Union and the United States, which is proved by quite a number of other examples. Now, is it all really hopeless? I listened carefully to what the representative of Luhansk said, and I understand his emotions. It is all perfectly understandable, but as a, a Ukrainian citizen, I would very much like for the Minsk agreements to be implemented and implemented in a way that all sides are satisfied, have a compromise, and we have a Donbass that has received what it wants. What does it want? It is stipulated in the Minsk agreements, but not fully. And here, I'd like to pay attention to one detail. We study the way 
conflicts in various countries of the world are solved and I can make the following remark here. I have a three page document called the package of measures. If I tried to show a document, for example, uh, a document settling de facto military conflict in Mozambique. It, all, it also has about three pages with principles of settlement, but they are, but they are extended by 50 more pages that disclose in detail the sense of every paragraph and every sentence of those three pages. Unfortunately, by now, no such protocols have emerged here. They must have emerged by now, but it didn't happen. I think attempts to draft a roadmap on the implementation of the Minsk agreements, those attempts that recently have found a reflection in a particular document prepared by Donetsk and Luhansk on one side and document presented by Leonid Kravchuk uh, in the trilateral contact group, the group that discusses ways of settlement. But unfortunately, those documents are incompatible yet. But I think that putting that writing down the ideas of what every side wants will be a step forward on the path of a compromise. Let me underline. It is very difficult for the Ukrainian authorities to follow the path of compromise because of internal political disputes. President Zelensky and his team very soon may could see for themselves that they were not able to follow the course that they had promised to their electors. They didn't have the right team, the passionate people who could support some hard-won compromise decisions. And in this situation, the Ukrainian authorities act under the pressure of external stakeholders. Ukraine seeks, and it has written it down in the constitution, membership in the European Union and the NATO. So it is natural that Ukraine listens to external advice. To my mind, this advice often does not give the expected result, to put it mildly. In this situation, it is one form of pressure and those external stakeholders have very different motivations. There are things they're interested in, there are things they're not interested in. Ms. Nikonorova mentioned the the nationalist section that is ready to speak up against any, even quite little, compromise. What can we say about it? Ukraine faces a very complicated choice, especially in the economic, social situation and bacteriological situation because of COVID-19. So the situation in the country is quite hard and politically it looks very unsustainable. There is much discontent of the population with the policy that Ukrainian authority is implementing. And to risk and to make any consent or any compromise to settle the conflict is very difficult for them, especially in a situation when in a situation when our representatives who represent in the Normandy format on the part of Germany and France do not display willingness to push 
besides towards a compromise. This creates almost a hopeless situation because the Ukrainian leadership without Western support, without support of France, Germany, the United States, cannot go for any compromise decision to settle the crisis. And in fact, the fate of this crisis will be defined by whether this position can be changed, whether this position with regard to compromise can be changed. I hope that the new leadership of the United States of America will give us hope that we can expect any favorable environment in Euro-Atlantic relations and that probably there will be some sort of a joint decision that will encourage Ukraine to look for compromise, which is held back on one part by radical circles and on the other part it is held back by our colleagues and Western partners who I think uh, are the reason why the package of measures is the way it looks, with very much uh, clauses that are hard to interpret. Uh, there is one clause which does not name Russia, but which means it, this clause says that there must be no help from the outside to the certain areas of Donetsk and Luhansk regions. When signing this clause, everyone understood perfectly well what was meant. And everyone thought that Russia will stop helping and this, the task will be solved. But nothing of the kind basically happened. And nothing could basically happen. That is why we found ourselves in such a difficult situation. And uh, what I said now, I believe I could afford saying at such high level. I thank you very much for your attention. And should you have any questions, I shall be ready to answer. Thank you very much for your expose. I must admit that I, I, I agree with your analysis uh, to, to, uh, to, uh, to a large extent. Uh, on how you you assess and analyze the the current state of affairs, the the uh, political uh, situation in Ukraine, which uh, which uh, uh, is one of the obstacles in uh, in fully engaging in realizing the Minsk agreements. You you mentioned uh, the sanctions factor, and I I must here cite uh, my minister Sergey Lavrov, who said uh, at an earlier stage. Uh, back in the uh, time when uh, Poroshenko was president of Ukraine, uh, he said uh, he said that uh, that's a paradox. Poroshenko and Kyiv do not implement Minsk agreements, but uh, Russia is being sanctioned for that, and that's that's the gist of what you exactly said. Indeed, the roadmap the roadmap to implement the Minsk agreements, which is a purpose. Uh, and the name of the Minsk contact group, uh, uh, we know that uh, that uh, uh, that the Ukrainian side presented its roadmap, that uh, uh, the region has presented its roadmap. They are not uh, they are not uh, uh, complementing, so to say. Uh, but the other thing is, as we know, that the Ukrainian side refuses to discuss the roadmap presented by the republics, uh, asking instead asking instead that uh, uh, that uh, the uh, Russian Federation should provide one, which we refuse to do for obvious reasons. Now you mentioned uh, the role of uh, the role of uh, the Normandy participants, in particular France and Germany. I already commented on, on that in my introductory remarks, uh, but I, I once wanted to add to that two things. Uh, first, I say often when we discuss Ukraine, uh, in official meetings of the Security Council, which happens from time to time, that there is one phenomenon which I call lost in translation, which means 
that not just Germany and France, but other countries, but Germany and France in particular, they do not understand completely the genesis of the Ukrainian crisis. On the one hand, because they, whether you want it, whether you're not, uh, however intelligent they are, but they are outsiders to this conflict. They do not understand uh, the things, delicate things, that uh, that are obvious, both to Ukrainians, whether they admit it or not, or to the representatives of Donbass or to the Russians. Unfortunately, they are deprived of that uh, of that being able uh, to immerse into the into the translation. And of course, the other factor is ideological and, and political, which is uh, which is uh, uh, which is Russia itself, which is another factor. Now, uh, according to the logic of today's meeting, I should be uh, giving a floor now to the participants of the normative forums, uh, to France and Germany, uh, who also chose to ignore the meeting, uh, like those who they convinced uh, to follow suit. Uh, but that, on the other hand, gives us a benefit to engage more uh, in a dialogue with the participants, with the brief briefers today, and I would uh, take a liberty on, upon myself uh, to ask questions to all of you. Uh, and I think that uh, by picking up these questions, I would, uh, one way or the other, I would reflect the narrative that would follow today were the, uh, the countries that chose to ignore present at that meeting. And the first question I'm pretty sure that they would uh, ask, in particular the republics, uh, where do you hide the Russian troops? Where are they? Uh, how do they, how did they participate in the conflict? Uh, because that, that's the narrative that we hear all the time, that it's not the Donbass population, but it's the Russian, uh, the Russian volunteers, uh, but in fact, Russian troops uh, who are in fact, in fact, uh, are, uh, are engaged, uh, engaged in, in, in uh, military warfare. Uh, secondly, uh, I think they would ask you uh, what Russia is doing to uh, to assist Donbas. Uh, they would claim that uh, you are effectively governed by the Russian Federation. That you are, as I said, puppets. You are not. Uh, you are not. You are not representing the people of Donbas, but uh, but you are representing actually Russian Federation. Uh, I think that I would uh, I would uh, leave it at here. I have more questions, and I of course welcome. I will wel would welcome questions from the participants if they have some, have any. But maybe I'll stop at that and ask uh, you to answer these uh, two first ones, and then I will pose additional questions. Who uh, is volunteering to start? Наталья? Да, Василий Алексеевич, могу, могу ответить и я. Yes, Ambassador. I could indeed answer. And indeed, we quite often hear those questions, for example, in interviews from journalists. The Ukrainian delegations already stopped asking such questions during the negotiations because they have received a very clear answer several times. First of all, let me remind that at the Security Council meeting, this question coming from the Ukrainian representative was addressed to Mr. Abakan, who back then was coordinator in the negotiations process on security issues. The permanent representative of Ukraine asked this question to Mr. Epekan, and Mr. Epekan gave a very direct answer. He said he did not see and he could not register presence of Russian troops in Donbas. Frankly speaking, to ask these questions, this question sounds a little bit laughable because Apparently, we hide this powerful army in such a professional way that no one is able to see it. 
if those people really asked us this question, we would ask them in return, are you being serious? Our rebels are armed with AK-47 that we could get from the military garrisons that transferred to our side, that we won at the battlefield, that were our trophies from the Ukrainian armed forces. It might sound a little bit funny, but this is also armaments that we took from our great patriotic war museums. Some of those armaments were disassembled in order for us to assemble the arms. I am not a large connoisseur of modern of modern weapons, but I'm deeply convinced that the armed forces of the Russian Federation definitely would not use the weapons and the guns that Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republic's forces have now. I think if the Russian Federation really was an aggressor to Ukraine, I think Kiev would not resist to such aggression for a long time. If we stop joking and start talking serious, the Security Council of the United Nations is the only institution that can define the presence of aggression. And it was the Security Council that, adopt, that endorsed the package of measures by its resolution, the document that prescribed the two sides of the conflict, Kyiv and Donbass, to have dialogue. So the answer to your first question we do not hide anyone. Our forces are at the borders of our republics, which unfortunately are quite in the middle of those republics, because we think the republic is the whole territory where the referendum was held. As for the help of the Russian Federation, uh, there is a lot of help. First of all, it's decree about the recognition of our documents, because without this decree, our population would be absolutely limited in its rights, because the Ukrainian, the blockade that Ukraine introduced against the republics put 4.5 million people on the brink of survival. All our basic rights, the right of freedom of movement was violated, the right to choose the place of living, the right to social services, the right to safe living conditions, all those were infringed. So thanks to such humanitarian steps, humanitarian decrees of the Russian Federation, we could survive. And we will not stop thanking Russia for the humanitarian convoys that in 2014, 2015, allowed us, allowed the population of Donbass to get by. Without those foods, it would have been extremely hard for us. No one had expected that there would be such a conflict, that Ukraine would dispatch its troops against us and that we would have to survive and take such decisions. At the very beginning, let me be frank, we were not even ready to the fact that we will have to think of the food for our population, that we would have to think where to have food for them. So those white trucks really saved lots of people. And we will not stop thanking Russia for that. I might add another point. 
it is the help as, as mediators in the negotiation process because without the representatives of Russia, the representatives of Ukraine would be even more outrageous during the negotiations. Ukraine still shows its total unwillingness to see facts, to listen to, to engage in dialogue with the representatives of Donbas. What also can be called help of Russia is their position that the point of view of Donbas must be heard. So we are thankful for that once again. But I, I see Natalia is is raising her hand. And la ladies first, let, let her speak out. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Ambassador. And Vladislav uh, gave a lot of detail in his answers. And I'd like to be brief and give a personal example to the question in response to the question you asked. Uh, for example, I'm an authorized representative in the Minsk negotiation. I have the pass passport of the citizen of Ukraine, but, but the, uh, the passport is not valid as of now because it expired around a year ago, a little bit less. Uh, and in order to fly to Minsk for the negotiations, I have no document that would allow me to take part in this process. And, and I don't have a possibility to get a new Ukrainian document because Ukraine withdrew from its territory all the state bodies and it blocked the border. And once again, Ukraine uh, persecutes persecutes uh, all of the, the participants of the events. And only thanks to the fact that the Russian Federation issues through a facilitated procedure, the passports of the citizens of Russian Federation, I was able to get this document and to continue taking part in the peaceful negotiation process. Otherwise, I would be deprived of this right because in order to get to the Republic of Belarus, to get to Minsk and take part in the negotiation, I need a document to cross two borders, the border between Donetsk, People Republic, and Russian Federation, and then from Russian Federation to the Republic of Belarus. It's a simple example that demonstrates that without this solution, humanitarian step on issuing uh, the passports of the Russian Federation through a facilitated procedure, we'd be just completely limited on our movement on all sides. This is just a brief but very clear example that illustrates of what is really going on and my personal example as well. Thank you. Thank you indeed. This is a clear example. <clears throat> I said that uh, there are countries that came here to learn, but there are other countries that uh, that chose uh, not to come here and not to learn. And I, I, I refer to it many times. I will come back to it when, when I speak uh, at, the, at the end of our meeting. Uh, now I, I fully understand and recognize the, <coughs> the wish uh, by uh, Mr. Pogrebinsky to see, to see Donbass reintegrated. Uh, that was a region and is a region of Ukraine that uh, enjoyed enjoyed life in, in one state before the conflict uh, erupted. <clears throat> uh, but the question is how, how to mend it, how to rectify. Uh, we see, uh, and you will agree with me, that uh, for whatever reasons, but there is uh, no, uh, no real willingness on the part of the Kiev authorities uh, to, to talk to Donbass, uh, and to take into account uh, to in account uh, its uh, its interests and and priorities. <clears throat> At the same time, we see from Kiev quite often that that Ukraine, Kiev wants to embrace Donbas, and uh, on the other hand, it uh, it says that uh, Donbas will will embrace Kiev immediately after Kiev uh, 
Kyiv uh, uh, restores the control over the territory. Well, I personally was uh, saying to my colleagues, and I, I personally was not a witness of any mass uh, scale protests in Donbass in the, the, against the de facto authorities. Any, uh, any registered human rights violations, for example. Uh, so I don't think that, uh, uh, that Donbass population as of today is so much willing to, to reintegra reintegrate. That's sad, but that's, uh, that's unfortunately a fact of reality which we have to deal with. My question to you, uh, Mikhail Borisovich, however difficult, I know that's not an easy question. Uh, what do you think Ukrainian authorities should do uh, to uh, maintain Donetsk and Lugansk uh, in the in the composition of Ukraine and to reintegrate uh, that region back. Mikhail Boris, microphone, please turn on the mic. Oh, thank you. Can you hear me? It's a very good question. And I can only say that I do not have a full answer, detailed answer to this question, taking into account the authorities we have right now. But if you want uh, to hear what would be right, in my opinion, I would say that there is a principled uh, positions of the Minsk agreements that cannot be changed. For example, ones that guarantees the safety to the people who live in certain areas of uh, Donetsk and Luhansk region. This guarantee can be only obtained in the order that is provided by the Steinmeier uh, formula. And the Ukrainian authorities agreed to that. There are paragraphs that through some protocols can be agreed, additionally agreed, so that the parties would understand which way each party should take to agree and to reach compromise about the amnesty, for example. In the text of the package of measures, there's no detailed information on this topic. And this is a reason for disagreements, but I think that there is a way to find a mutually accepted solution, but this certain protocol should be prepared for that, who would give a detailed information on how and what way the compromise can be reached. Now on the issue on holding uh, the elections on the territory of Donbass, I see there is, I can say there's no way of Direct I do not see an opportunity to directly implement this idea. The Kyiv's position is that lay down your arms. All those who are armed constitute illegal armed formations, so they have to lay down their arms. Then the border issue, then elections. Uh, Steinmeier formula envisages another succession. But the question is how to convince the elections so that all sides recognize them as effective. It takes compromise. The sides need a specialized protocol, a specialized draft law uh, on the package of measures that has to be voted in Verkhovna Rada. Besides, there are things that Verkhovna Rada has already voted on. And those are categorical positions that run counter both to the letter and spirit of the Minsk agreements. Is there an opportunity to take a step back? Of course there is. But this should be a step that would be mutually agreed with the special areas of Donetsk and Luhansk. I do not see any specific problems that only takes political will to follow this path. Let me give you an example of double standards. We know that there is a Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus. 
which is recognized by no one but Turkey. There are Turkish troops in there. There are elections organized there on a regular basis. I must say that people who win the elections there are recognized by European and global community as representatives of Turkish community. Those countries do not recognize this state, but some international institutions, this Turkish Republic has its observers. For example, in the League of Arab States, if I'm not mistaken, and in some other organizations. This is obviously accepted by the global community, but when it comes to the representatives elected in Donetsk and Luhansk, they are not recognized as the representatives of this commune. It is not about recognizing their statehood, it is about recognizing them as representatives of their community. I understand why our leaders have this position, because as soon as we recognize that these people represent a community that lives in there, they will be the opponents in the negotiation process, which is an opportunity to walk the way of peaceful settlement, because it is always good to talk to real people representing the local community. But then the format of the crisis will change. The crisis will cease to be international, so to speak, Russia between Russia and Ukraine. It will be internal Ukrainian conflict. And this is something that Ukrainian authorities are not okay with. And I would say that uh, our Western friends are, are not okay with this. They would like to preserve the format that exists today in order to have an opportunity in order to have an opportunity to strategically deter Russia, the way they call it. I hope this is a temporary state of affairs, and as soon as there is a chance to find a reasonable compromise between Europe and Russia, between Washington and Russia, there will be another interpretation of this conflict, which can give a, an impetus to serious and long-term settlement of the conflict in the east of Ukraine. Difficult, difficult to wrap anything to it. In particular, to the latter part of what Mikhail Borisovich was uh, was saying, uh, well, that that's obvious to us as well. But unfortunately, unfortunately, the reality is is a little bit different. And indeed, indeed, uh, uh, the 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 way how how we define the conflict that that is perhaps the main stumbling block on the on the progress towards towards the settlement. Uh, besides besides our friends and partners uh, in the west uh, i think that ukraine also benefits uh, at least partly maybe maybe not even partly from defining this conflict as as an interstate conflict rather than domestic one uh, a domestic one domestic conflict if qualified this way it entails so many consequences political uh, moral cultural economic, whatever, uh, that uh, for the time being, at least, uh, it is much more easier to hide be behind behind uh, the qualification of this conflict as a conflict between uh, Ukraine and Russia. Well, by de facto, by default, by the de facto, this conflict uh, became a political conflict between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, but uh, the authorities, of course, they go beyond that. For them, it's not uh, so important that it's a political conflict, which is a, a factor and a derivative from the uh, from the whole situation. But but to, to brand it as a military conflict, uh, first of all, uh, and from that all all uh, many things, most of the things uh, proceed. Now, I, I my intention is to uh, to give the floor to the briefers uh, for their statements uh, in the end of our meeting. Uh, 
uh, whatever they want to say to say after they've been speaking, hearing, and uh, responding to questions. Uh, we, of course, will continue continue this practice, uh, and we earnestly hope that uh, next time we'll be joined by those uh, uh, who have uh, who have to say their own truth uh, as they deem uh, it uh, right. Because we do not write scenarios for these meetings, we do not indoctrinate people what to say. We are for the open and frank dialogue and exchange of opinions. Uh, only that frank and direct exchange of opinions can can bring better understanding of where we are and, and where we should be moving. And I will start. I will start with Natalia. Uh, Natalia with uh, her uh, her wrap up of the of today's uh, meeting. Thank you, Ambassador. Let me once again express our gratitude for an opportunity to present our vision and to give the information as we see it as the second side of the conflict, Don Donbass and Republic sees it. Let me uh, get back a little bit to the previous statements. The word occupation is very harsh on one's ear. The phrase occupied territories is also harsh to hear. Indeed, Ukrainian authorities often use this term that here in the republics we are clueless as to whom we are occupied by. I am a Donetsk native. Is it me who occupied the city of Donetsk? It's kind of strange. And I have many compatriots here. They are all here. Can you occupy your own home? We think you cannot. Besides, the Minsk agreements do not contain such terminology. So we would very much encourage the global community to be very cautious when using those terms. I would like to agree with Mr. Pogrebinsky that there are some draft laws, some voted legal acts, acts that Verkhovna Rada has voted with that have never been negotiated in the Minsk negotiation process as it is prescribed by the package of measures. Today we raised a number of factors, a number of details about the real state of affairs and about what is going on in the Minsk negotiation process. What, quite unexpectedly, we received support from Kiev, from Mr. Pogrebinsky. Uh, it all proves that Ukraine does not intend to have negotiations with Donbass. It does not intend to meet its international obligations as a package of measures that has been endorsed by a Security Council resolution. If it's not going to listen to us, to observe our rights, to take on board our opinion, it is clear for us. Now, over the seven years of a de facto war waged by Ukraine against the people of Donbas, our own hopes and aspirations regarding uh, prospects of Minsk negotiation process have changed. Uh, I mean, those initial uh, aspirations that we had back in 2014, 2015. We greatly respect the international law and our own obligations under the package of measures. That is why we continue to work actively by proposing new ideas on how to implement this document and how to follow the peaceful path we have put forward, our roadmap, our plan of action. And should you like to study it, you will hardly find any discrepancy in it with the package of measures because the plan is aimed to implement the package. However, we do not hear any reaction coming from the Ukrainian side. At this point, I'd like to support uh, my colleague, Mr. Denego, that it is getting harder and harder for us to respond to the questions posed 
by the people of Donbas who ask us with fear and anticipation after every round of Minsk negotiations. Is Ukraine likely to get back here? Are nationalist battalions and armed formation of uh, Ukraine security forces uh, likely to get back here? Those who tortured our children, who killed, who killed people, who sabotaged the water station that supplied water to the entire Donbas. Will they get back in here? Will you give up the border to them? And it is getting more and more complicated for us with every decision of theirs, with the draft law on internment, with every other shot they take. It is getting harder and harder for us to answer those questions and to look in the eyes of our people, seeing fear of Ukraine and of Ukrainian enforcement authorities in their eyes. Taking into account the fact that Ukraine in the negotiation process refuses to actually negotiate, at least to listen to the part of opinion of Donbas. I think everybody knows the expression that it is only one time that uh, a state shoots at its own people, only the first shot is at its own people. Every other shot is at the people that is not their own anymore. Here comes a question that we would like to put to the members of Security Council who are present here at this meeting. We understand that as of today, the package of measures is the only mechanism to settle the conflict that has no alternative. But probably over the seven years, taking into account the unwillingness and uh, de facto refusal of Ukraine to implement this document, probably we should engage direct democracy mechanisms and ask the people of Donbass what they want. We are ready to convene in accordance with all international principles of this, of this act of determination. We are ready to, con to comply with all the conditions so that the results of this referendum are recognized. We are ready to facilitate access of any international global observers no matter how many of them there might be, but we want the voice of the people of Donbass to be heard. To be heard. This is 4.5 million people who have been living under fire for seven years, who have been ignored by for seven years. Once again, I would like to thank you for this meeting and for an opportunity for us to present our position. Let me repeat that we remain committed to our international obligations and we will be implementing the documents that have been endorsed by the Security Council. But in fact, Ukraine is only one step away from withdrawing from those negotiations. So we think it's time we implemented Article 1 of the UN Charter. We stand ready for that and we call upon you not to let a disaster happen and to act in a preventive mode. Thank you for your attention. Uh, whatever happens, uh, we still need to be optimistic and believe that we uh, will be able to reach, to reach uh, uh, the settlement and, uh, and to, to adhere to aspirations of all who participate in it. And I believe that today the members of the Security Council and those who uh, joined them, uh, other delegations, uh, participated in a very important meeting. We listened to the positions uh, of uh, representative of Donbas and politologists from Kiev uh, and, uh, and positions of representative of Donbas, representatives of Donbas, unfortunately, uh, are usually, not even often, but usually muted and seriously distorted. And this meeting was not about promoting separatism uh, uh, as our Ukrainian, uh, official Ukrainian and Western colleagues will most likely label it, uh, we gathered to, to, today to review the implementation of Minsk agreements 
will with the uh, assistance of those uh, who are most interested in the success of this process. Uh, I, and I would like to, say, to stress once again, I think it was, uh, it was uh, a consensus among all uh, who, spoke, uh, who spoke at this meeting that uh, these agreements endorsed by UN Security Council re resolution uh, at present and at this moment uh, are, uh, have no alternative. They are the only means uh, to, uh, to, uh, to come to a settlement eventually. We, repeated, uh, we repeatedly refuted uh, uh, Ukrainian de allegations, official Ukrainian de allegations, echoed by some uh, Western uh, uh, countries that, that Russia, I quote, violates Minsk agreements. Uh, today, you heard first-hand information about this issue, uh, which is uh, much more valuable than any allegations. Uh, that is exactly the reason why Kyiv, supported by Berlin and Paris, did everything to prevent this meeting from happening and uh, finally ignored participating in it. Because truth hurts, unfortunately. And what we heard today is very uncomfortable for our Ukrainian and Western colleagues. They simply have nothing to say against this truth. Instead, they create a smoke screen, masking their inability to engage in, in meaningful discussion. We regret this. We want to see our Ukrainian neighbors sane and prosperous. Mm -hmm. Instead, we see, uh, uh, instead of Ukraine, we once knew and loved uh, a sort of anti-Russia, ignoring realities, turning their fear to what Russian-speaking population in particular, and in particular in the east of the country wants. Today meeting clearly demonstrated that uh, this extremely harmful trend uh, for, for Ukraine itself persists. It is very discouraged, but we will not abandon our efforts to make Ukraine, Ukraine honor its obligations and implement what uh, had been agreed. Uh, there is no simply any other way to solve this inter-Ukrainian crisis. Dialogue is also indispensable for the same and we will be actively encouraging Kyiv to engage in dialogue with its own people. We also, uh, we all should understand that there is only one alternative to this, which I, uh, which I even wouldn't dare pronounce, but I have to. The alternative to this is war, which we would like to avoid at any cost. And this is not an exaggeration, but this is a gruesome reality. Uh, let's not forget about it. We thank our today's briefers uh, and consider everything that was said today by them extremely important. Uh, therefore, we think that this meeting was very useful and we are very satisfied that it took place. We thank those delegations that chose to participate in it uh, and those who chose to boycott it have exposed themselves and have clearly taken sight in this civil Ukrainian conflict instead of trying to be unbiased intermediaries. We will, of course, take due note of that. But for one thing, I have to thank uh, them, those who, uh, who were absent today. Uh, we all benefited from their absence uh, in a sense that our briefers, uh, their briefers, our briefers were able to speak out more, uh, more at this meeting. Once again, thank you very much. Uh, all the best to you. We will follow up on this and we'll find other ways how to engage in a similar discussion. Thank you and goodbye.